Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Um, on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, uh, welcome to our conversation on maintaining innovation, leadership, and protecting national security through intellectual property. Um, we've got a great discussion teed up, and we're going to hear in just a, a few moments from um, Brian Pomper and Deanna Tanner Oaken, uh, who, who are going to walk us through um, in detail some of the things we need to think about when it comes to the application of, of intellectual property policy um, to national security and to helping the United States maintain its innovation leadership. Uh, the center has been, for the last couple of years, uh, focusing a lot of its work studying the executive and legislative branches and the overlap between the two on specific national security case studies under an, an umbrella of uh, great powers competition, um, how we can keep the United States in a position of leadership competing with um, the rising power of uh, China and also to, to some extent Russia. And our focus um, has been very much on the area of geotechnology competition, uh, things we can do to enhance the ability of the United States to compete, um, to dominate uh, and be uh, effectively win in the competition over advanced technologies like uh, 5G and soon to be getting into 6G um, communication networks, artificial intelligence, quantum computing and other areas where we felt that the United States uh, has an imperative to, to win the competition and where policy is being made in both the executive and legislative branches and the relationship between the two are gonna be vital in positioning ourselves for, for success there. A lot of the areas we've looked at in terms of how to position the country for success have touched on uh, making investments in um, production, domestic production, um, in focusing on supply chains and, and supply chain security. We've looked at um, federal bureaucracy and the organization and how that's aligned to the goal. Um, we have delved deeply into cooperation with allied countries in leveraging one of the strengths of the United States, which is our friendships with other countries and our economic relationships. And um, we have recently started looking carefully at the area of intellectual property uh, because it actually plays quite a significant role and requires um, a particular uh, focus in terms of how IP impacts national security and how we can think about um, keeping America winning on the innovation edge. We uh, have come to the conclusion persistently that the United States has a strong advantage um, in our innovation, our ability to produce and bring to market new ideas. Uh, but we are competing with uh, authoritarian govern uh, governments who often have an advantage in efficiency and coordination, if you wanna call it that, um, their able ability to move their governance, or excuse me, government and um, business sectors in one direction by decree. Uh, we don't operate that way and we're happy with our system but it means we've got to be vigilant and we've got to find ways to keep leveraging our innovation um, to keep our leadership strong. I'm very pleased to, to have um, the ability to host this conversation today. We, we've got some great speakers. Uh, Deanna Tanner Oaken, um, who is a managing partner at AMS Trade and has uh, served as a, a chair of the US International Trade Commission, uh, among other, other uh, career accomplishments. Brian Pomper, who is Executive Director of the Innovation Alliance, um, among other things, served as Chief International Trade Counsel to Senate Finance Committee Chairman Max Baucus um, during his time on the Hill. Very pleased to have some solid expertise here. Dan Mahaffey, Senior Vice President at CSBC, will moderate the conversation. Let me turn it back to Dan now. Welcome, and Dan, get us kicked off here. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Thanks for setting us up and a, a great introduction of our program. Uh, laying out how we do look at that overall 
innovation ecosystem and, and the policies that relate to this. And I think it's very important given how the these policies and this innovation comes from one, that intellectual base, and two, how the decisions we make now affect years, if not decades down the road when it comes to technology, technology standards. So I wanna turn it first actually to Brian to set the table for us uh, in terms of that, that pipeline from ideas to innovation, uh, what that means for our leadership and, and what this issue too of these specific patents we'll be talking about, standards, essential patents, why they matter. Brian. Great, uh, great. thanks Dan and, and thanks Glenn. I appreciate the invitation to be here. I usually say that I rarely give up the opportunity to hear myself talk. So thank you for giving, giving me the opportunity. And Glenn, let me say, I think you, you set it up really well. Uh, and it, it is th this issue in terms of innovation in the United States and, and what are the policies that we need to promote innovation. Uh, you articulated exactly the way I think about it. You know, in the United States, uh, one of the first acts that Congress passed when the new um, the government was created in 1790 was the Patent Act. You know, we, we knew from very early on that we were trying to incentivize innovation and we wanted this new country to be as innovative economically and, and uh, through creativity as they were in governance. Uh, and that worked very well uh, for a very long time. The patent system, honestly, I think has been a critical part of creating what we have today, which is the largest, most vibrant economy the, the world has ever seen. I will say uh, in my um, role as the executive director of the Innovation Alliance, which is a, a group of companies who are, are really high tech R&D focused companies who care very much about the patent system. Uh, I have seen over the course of the last dozen or so years working on this, that that's not a universally held view in the United States. Uh, there are companies who uh, are US companies who uh, they're, they're highly innovative companies, but they don't make their money by selling their inventions. They make their money by packaging other people's inventions and then selling those in a, in a product. And so they have been incentivized for the last however many years to dumb down the patent system, to make patents harder to get to make them harder to enforce, to make them easier to invalidate. And I think that is just a tragedy. And, and honestly, almost in some respects, uh, unpatriotic, because I, I feel like, to your point, Glenn, you know, we're no longer uh, so clearly winning the future. You know, we, we have a, a competitor nation in China that can snap its fingers and direct $50 billion of investment into AI or 5G, or clean energy, electric vehicles, you name it. Uh, they don't need to worry about policies. It's a command and control economy in this way. In the United States, we have to have the right policy architecture to make sure that private sector investment flows into these high-tech areas where we really want that, that research to happen. Now, if the government can seed initial uh, preliminary research, but there's never enough money for that. Uh, and in truth, to really develop these inventions, you need the private sector behind you. And if we dumb down the patent system in the way that we, we have and in, in candidly continue to do so in ways that I'll explain here in a moment, uh, we're, we're really just shooting ourselves in the foot. And the real beneficiary here is China. And, and I think any, anybody who looks at this from a a uh, geostrategic competitive standpoint should think to themselves, boy, we got to make sure that we get this policy environment right in the United States to make sure that we really are providing the incentives that the private sector needs to invest in these high tech cutting edge type of, uh, of, of areas. And, and again, I candidly, I, I feel like we, we're really losing sight of that. And a great example of that is the standard essential patent uh, issue that, that, that Dan mentioned. What on earth am I talking about? Standard essential patent. Well, they, they call them SCPs. So I'll, I'll use that terminology so I'm not saying it all the time. So um, when you, uh, well, 5G is a great example. The way that the 5G technology came into existence was that all of the companies who uh, have technology, telecommunications technologies, and actually many of the implementers too, all sit around a table and they figure out, okay, what problems do we need to solve if we want 5G to be to work? We got to figure out you know, um, how, how can the wave, can the telecommunications uh, radio waves, can they go through glass? How thick are the walls they're going to go to? Like all the different types of 
problems. How far away do you need to be from a cell tower? All these kind of technical problems that need to be sorted out. All the engineers sit around a table and they, they come up with these problems. They go back to their companies and they've come up with technical solutions to solve those problems. They patent those inventions because that's what companies do. And then when uh, it comes to creating the standard, it's by consensus, the standards bodies that they operate in will decide, okay, well, that is really good technology that company A has, and that is really good company B, and we're gonna incorporate this into the standard. So that's like 5G is a standard. Now, when you have a standard, companies uh, will have to tell the standards body, hey, I know you've created the standard. I have technology that reads on that standard. What I mean is I have a patent that I think is essential to that standard. And what that means, the technical definition is if a company is using the standard, they are by definition using that patented technology. So that is a standard essential patent. The patent that you have is essential to the standard itself. So if you're using the standard, you're using the patent, you gotta take out a license. Now there is an argument that having your technology, your patent incorporated into a standard gives you a lot of market power, right? Because everybody wants to use 5G and if they've got to use your technology, if they want to use 5G, boy, you know, you could charge whatever you want. Well, the truth is there's a quid pro quo. If your patent is incorporated into a standard, you also have to agree that you are going to license your patent to anybody who wants it on what's called fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, FRAND terms. So basically, you, you can't hold people over a barrel, right? You got you to gotta negotiate with them in good faith and come to some licensing agreement that you're, you're, you're both copacetic with. Why am I going into such detail for how the system works? Well, there have been for some time, again, many of the same companies who I think have worked to dumb down the patent system the past you know, 10, 15, 20 years or so, they started to argue, well, wait a minute. If these companies that have standard essential patents have agreed to license on FRAND terms, to license all comers, then they should never be able to sue somebody who is using their, that patent and try to get an injunction against them continuing to use the patent. There should be no such thing as injunctive relief because damages are always good enough company has said they've agreed to license on FRAN terms. So they clearly, it's just, we're just talking about money, right? It's that, that old, uh, you know, Oscar Wilde thing, right? We're, we're just negotiating over price, right? Uh, so uh, the problem with that way of thinking about the issue, if I've got a standard central patent, uh, I tell, uh, you know, my, my, somebody's using the standard, I tell them, hey, you're, you're using the standard, we need to negotiate a license. If that counterpart, if the person using the technology knows at the very beginning that there's nothing I can do to stop them from using that patent, they have every incentive in the world to drag out the negotiation as long as possible to force me to sue them for patent infringement, knowing that at the end of the day, the best I could hope to get in damages is the same Frand royalty that they were obligated to pay me at the very beginning. So if they lose at the very end, hey, it's the same thing. So they've got every incentive not to negotiate, to, to drag it out. You know, who knows? Maybe I'm a small company and I don't have the resources to go through a big, long, protracted litigation. And maybe they'll end up scot-free at the end of the day without having to pay any license at all. So I, I tell you all that because we're talking about the executive branch and the Congress. The executive branch... Uh, has uh, several times over the course of the last few years. In 2013, uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the Department of Justice, uh, I, I think, I can't remember if it was the FTC or not as well, but th there was a policy statement that came out in 2013 that suggested that, you know, in that circumstance with standard essential patents, uh, injunctive relief may be available in certain narrow circumstances. It was misinterpreted at the time for, for several years thereafter, essentially to be a, a, a note to the courts, injunctive relief should not be available for standard essential patents. Caused enormous havoc. And so in 2019, uh, then uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General Macon Delrahim uh, and uh, again, I can't remember who else, US, oh, Andre Yanku, others 
and the administration issued a new uh, guidance in 2019 that said, actually, standard essential patents are patents like any other, and they are due the same sort of remedies that any other patents could, could have. And that seemed to set to rights the situation. The reason I'm talking so much about this, and forgive me for the long explanation, but I think it's important for folks to, to understand. Uh, recently, this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, has put out a new draft policy statement on standard essential patents that makes it pretty clear and says very clearly that uh, injunctive relief is, should not generally be available for standard essential patents. And as I mentioned to you, that really skews any kind of negotiation strongly in favor of the implementer and against the, the patent holder. There were quite a few folks that uh, responded to the request for comments uh, to this uh, proposed statement. Uh, and there were many, many, many people who expressed concern, many in the national security architecture, because their point is, boy, you know, if we don't have the right policy architecture, China is going to eat our lunch. And the, the, because China is investing billions and billions of dollars into these exact same technologies, uh, China doesn't rely on patents for this kind of investment. It's all subsidies and government funding. Uh, and by the way, who are the biggest beneficiaries? Who are the biggest implementers? Where are most uh, high-tech uh, parts manufactured? Uh, it's often it's in China. So you, you really do have the situation where if the administration were to go down this road, you are disadvantaging the US, the, the most innovative US and Western companies, and you are advantaging Chinese companies uh, to a, to a great degree, so much so actually that one of the commenters who actually supported the change was an organization called the Patent Protection Association of China, which includes Huawei and other major Chinese com uh, uh, component or uh, uh, companies. And of course, no surprise why they're in favor of it, because you know that it'll make their license fees all the less. So uh, I'm happy to talk more about that, but I, I don't want to filibuster here. I want to give Deanna the opportunity to talk and uh, we could talk more about, about uh, how this all works in, in practice. Thanks, Brian. Deanna, I'll turn it over to you for a little bit more on, on how we got here uh, and uh, how it fits in this competition we talk about. Great, well, thank you. And uh, thanks to both to you, Dan, and to Glenn, um, both for the important work you're doing at the CSPC and also for the invitation to uh, appear today and, and talk about this um, this issue. And it's always a particular pleasure to be on the same uh, virtual stage with Brian Pomper, uh, an old friend and someone who I respect both for the leadership he showed when he was on the Hill and that he continues to show um, in uh, helping companies at this intersection of, of innovation, in innovation and, and navigating the legislative landscape, which as he's described very well, uh, has changed over the last um, several years, and I would I would agree with him, not not in a way that I think enhances U.S. competitiveness, um, which is something we want to talk about today, and and how the policy statement and some of these other policies might uh, fit into that, and and what we can do, and what it means for um, uh, for other countries and how they view us, and and how what our role is in the world. So, um, I, I guess I. As I'm thinking about this uh, today, and um, and you know, look forward to our conversation. There are kind of three things that have been on my mind, and and one just because we are coming out of the rages of the pandemic. I think one lesson that we should learn from the pandemic, putting the politics all to the side, um, is what did it teach us about the importance of investment in research and development? What did it teach us about? Uh, the critical technologies and the importance of IP protection. And I think if you look, read the stories of the scientists and the entrepreneurs who contributed to bringing vaccines um, to the market in you know, turbocharged time and who continue to innovate and develop um, the treatments for, for COVID-19, I think that's a story that we should remember as we're talking about all these issues, including standard essential policies, that the investment that's needed in in drugs and treatments, in critical technologies, in 5G and 6G, uh, all of these things, there, there are many failures along the way in companies. And, and as, as Brian has rightly pointed out in the United States, the reason these technologies have come to market is because people took a chance. And sometimes that chance doesn't pay off. And sometimes it pays off you know, very nicely, but they're investing for the long-term and we need policies, structure, 
in place, infrastructure in place that supports that. So with that as an overview, we then you know, talk about some of these policies, including the draft policy statement. And I appreciate Brian laying out both the role of standard essential policy patents and how that intersects with this policy statement. And I think one thing that, that again, strikes me is I, I very much appreciate the Biden administration's initial executive orders with respect to competitiveness, with respect to um, diversity in the supply chain, because I think there's a, uh, and, and secure, securing our supply chain. These are really important issues. And I think with, uh, particularly with the emphasis uh, we have today on, on national security, um, you know, th this is all really important. What I'm disappointed in is what came out of that was instead of having a, um, a process that included bringing stakeholders together that would have included looking at the economic data, the empirical data, as opposed to just talking about theoretically um, what a standard essential policy patent means and, and what a rights holder gets versus um, uh, the licensee. Um, instead of bringing together the agencies with uh, their heads in, in place, they put out a draft policy statement that uh, I think doubles down on the 2013 statement that, that Brian referenced in really putting forth kind of legal conclusions, legal um, directives to agencies and to the courts. And um, as Glenn noted, I mean, I, I sat a commissioner at the ITC, so voted on, on cases under section 337, which is the intellectual property part of the trade statute. Um, and to have this directive come out from the administration that it is essentially undermining the statutory framework that Congress put forth in terms of if the ITC finds a violation, right, finds that a uh, patent has been infringed, the ITC is policy neutral, or, sorry, patent neutral, technology neutral, right? A patent is a patent. And so if you find infringement, the remedy available, because this is a trade statute, is a remedy at the border. And the policy statement uh, essentially goes around that without going through Congress. And I think um, you know, those who uh, work in public policy should be really concerned about, uh, about the direction that the policy statement goes in and, and how it should instead be uh, a thoughtful uh, conversation and perhaps one that involves, I would say, if, if you're gonna do this, you need to involve Congress as, as well. Um, and then finally, I, I guess I would just pick up on, on um, Brian's important point and, and what I hear from both from Glenn and Dan, which is, you know, the, the world is watching and no one's watching more uh, with more, um, more at stake than China and Chinese state-owned enterprises. For all the reasons Brian laid out, to, see, to have the United States uh, back away from a virtuous cycle, which has included the bedrock of having intellectual property protections in place, that that led to investment. Instead, the Chinese can go in, and particularly on these standard settings and all these technologies where the US has, you know, again, invested heavily. If we undermine that system, if we interrupt the virtuous cycle uh, in favor of implementers just being able to take the intellectual property and use it without the return to the IP owners, then the United States is on the losing side of that. And I think it's, uh, you know, all we need to do is look at uh, you know, really look at the data. The IP intensive industries in the United States contribute a seven trillion dollars to the U.S. economy. I think it's, I think the latest study was thirty three percent of jobs are in IP intensive industries. So it's it's those it's it's those things that are result that are a result of a strong IP system uh, is what I think we should have in our you know in front of us as we think about these different policies. It doesn't mean things should never change. There's not uh, you know every system is not perfect for 200 years, but before walking down a different road, um, I think we would be, um, it would be better for us to stand back a little bit, look at what we've achieved and why, uh, and listen to those who invested uh, and the returns that, that they need to see in terms of these critical technologies, the companies who have made these long-term bets, um, that their voice should be heard and not overridden by these large tech companies uh, and the, the Chinese state-owned enterprises. So um, I know we want to get into more detail on all that. So I think I will stop there. Um, but again, very much appreciate the conversation and the dialogue today. Yeah, th th thanks to both of you. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Dan in a second to, to uh, pitch some questions he has and then 
um, fold in questions that um, the other attendees may have, but um, I'd like to take uh, prerogative if I could just to ask maybe one additional question of each of you. You, um, after laying the issues out, talk, talked somewhat about the national security implications, which is an area where we've been particularly focused and um, talked about, you, you ended your comments talking about um, China's interest in the issue and how, where they had kind of weighed in on this question. I remember going back to being a foreign service officer. I, I was posted in East Asia as an economics officer and was one of my job duties was to look out for US intellectual property. And um, I did it in some, some of the more obvious things, you know, going after pirated software. A little, a little bit more nuanced and complicated, but seems to have very serious implications for um, this competition that we're in with China. Studying the lessons from uh, 4G, development of 4G technology, US you know, versus China competing on this, um, seeing what happened to, to us as the 5G started rolling out and how we were in a very difficult position competing with China in the world. Looking ahead, can you just delve a little more into how this impacts that question of US-China competition, and especially when it touches on um, the areas of national security and our imperative to, to win these, these competitive challenges on some of these technology, where, where does this play in, in your mind? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Glenn, I, I appreciate that. But, uh, look, I think it's, it's central. Uh, I mean, let me say it to you this way, I, I don't blame the companies who are advocating for these changes, right? Companies are private actors, they're always going to act in terms of their own interests. If we just look at, say, the cell phone industry and using 5G or, or whatever technology, but now it happens to be mostly 5G, uh, it, you know, there are roughly, I think, about as many cell phones on planet Earth as there are people, right? And they all cost about $1,000 each, can I say? So that's but that's a market of $7 trillion for cell phones. And by the way, everyone has to be replaced every two or three years. If they could just shave half a percentage off of the kind of license fee they have to pay, just half a percentage point, that's $35 billion. I mean, the amount of money that is at stake is staggering. So it's no surprise to me that they are trying their best to change the system through political means and otherwise in ways that are gonna serve their bottom line. What, what I take issue with is the, the government and policymakers actually falling for that and, and not looking out for the broader uh, public interest. And it gets to where you're, you're saying, Glenn, you know, there are now only really a handful of Western companies that uh, devote the kind of time and energy and resources it takes to be on the tippy top cutting edge of these technologies to come up, you know, to think of a problem that's never been solved before and then solve it and incorporate it into these standards. I would say Qualcomm, Interdigital, Nokia, Ericsson. I mean, that, that may be it, honestly. On the other side, you've got a whole slew of Chinese companies led by Huawei and others who are making real gains. Uh, I, I mean, you know, for a long time, I think there was this sense that, well, you know, in America, we make new stuff and in China, they're just copying us. And, and that, that may, be, may have been primarily true at one point and, and maybe it's still true. But make no mistake, I mean, these companies are really doing some excellent, very high-end, cutting-edge work. I mean, it's a race. And at the end of the day, if the Western companies aren't compensated, if they can't make money from doing what we're doing, again, if the policy architecture isn't flowing money to, to, to support this kind of cutting-edge research, they're going to stop doing it. Chinese are not going to stop doing it. And so what does that mean? It means that the future telecommunication network will be controlled by companies that are ultimately answerable to the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, just to be clear. So from that standpoint, I think that the national security implications are dire. I mean, you, you could, again, you, you could pick an, an industry, uh, AI. I mean, we, we know that the, the, the Chinese sometimes use AI in, in ways that, that make, that, uh, they sh that in the United States would be anathema, facial recognition for, uh, you know, trying to find certain ethnic minorities, these sorts of things. Uh, AI, quantum computing, uh, electric vehicles, I, I mean, all these things, electric batteries, all these types of technologies, the Chinese are focused on them. 
they're planning, they're, they're, they are intending to not just to, to invest and create jobs in these areas, they're intending to defeat us purposefully, right? They're, they are uh, trying to become the preeminent world power. And it, it really, I, I, I wish that policymakers could think about this the way that I do, uh, because I, I really think, obviously, I think I'm right, right? I, I think these policies and the IP uh, system that we're talking about and uh, the kind of innovative incentives are just critical for the future. And sometimes I, I worry that members of Congress don't even know how to spell IP, right? They just, you know, they're not focused on it in this way. That's obviously, it's my job to try to help them see it this way. And I, I, I do my level best. But uh, I personally think that it's absolutely critical. So that's a long answer to your question. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your comment. Being a former member, I can also appreciate the, the, the bandwidth question when it comes to what members can spend their time getting deeply knowledgeable about. It's always a, it's always a competition across many issues. Um, but I appreciate you, Brian, lay, laying out the implications for national security, because I think that want to frame this. Um, Deanna, maybe I can just ask you to, to expound a little more on the process question. You, you had just um, shared some thoughts on what's the best way to have a conversation that could ensure that these points are raised. Um, to your mind, what's the best way to get the stakeholders at the table in a way that's most fruitful? Again, I think the Biden administration started with a good idea, which is, you know, uh, issues an executive order that says, you know, we want all of the government to really focus on, on thinking about these issues. But from there, I think you have to go to a, who needs to be at the table? It can't, it can't just be, uh, you know, this type of company or that type of company, right? You need all the stakeholders and some are gonna agree with what Brian and I are saying here and some of them aren't, but you need, you need those people at the table. But you also need to look at the empirical data because I think one of the things, and, and Brian probably has even more specifics of this, I mean, one of the things that um, strikes me about some of the conversations that have gone on about uh, changing some of these IP laws is they're all very theoretical, that they're, you know, that, that somehow if you, you know, don't make it easier for people to implement, um, you know, there's the, the SCP rights holders, again, are going to hold out for all the money in the world and that that's their incentive. And I think Brian spoke to that. And so I think actually looking at what's happened and what has been a virtuous cycle requires looking at data and understanding it. And then finally, you need to have all the agencies at the table, um, including you know, DOD on the national security side, talking about what, what they're seeing, right? Um, it includes, of course, DOJ and FTC. Um, you know, I would put the ITC at the table too because of the trade, you know, you need USTR. I think you need an inter, a really robust interagency process um, to be able to think about this more thoughtfully. And, and I think at the end of the day, one of the things that you would think um, the group would come up to, or what I would hope would come out is, the United States needs more tools to combat uh, intellectual property theft, um, espionage, you know, the, the uses of artificial intelligence, not less. And I see the approach they're taking is removing tools instead of adding to them. And again, I, I think it's, it's um, from the ITC, perspective, from a trade perspective, that remedy at the border is, an, it is fundamental, right? I mean, that, that really the ability to stop a good that's infringing or, you know, or, or an unfair trade practice is critical, not, not to protect the U.S. industry from competition, but to protect the U.S. industry from theft. And so again, I, I see just too much of a, let's remove these tools, let's remove this, let's, you know, let's lower the threshold. And I think we, given the threats we face, and I think Brian's done a great job in, in articulating those, um, given the threats we face, it seems like we would, should be thinking about better tools, <laughs> more creative way to use our tools, uh, and how to ensure that we have leadership in these standard setting organizations um, as, we, as we look forward to the future. You know, if I could just add just a couple of quick things here in response to that. So uh, a few things in terms of, you know, data, Dan, as you said, one reason why I think policymakers have acted to, to dumb down the patent system has been this call that there are patent trolls taking over uh, the economy and the litigation rate is, is going through the roof. In truth, uh, the litigation rate has stayed pretty constant 
since the founding of the United States at about 2% of patents issued fall, find themselves in litigation. Now, there was a big litigation spike. I do have to admit, there's a big litigation spike, but it was in the 1850s and it was about sewing machines. So this idea that there's some you know, catastrophic tidal wave of, of lawsuits, is just, it is just demonstrably false, but it's found purchase in the popular imagination. The second thing I'd say is, again, I, I mentioned that there are just about as many cell phones as there are humans on, on planet Earth, because that all happened with the system the way it's worked for a long time, where you've got this uh, private system of standards uh, 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 developing organizations and the implementers and the patent holders negotiating. Sometimes they they duke it out, but you know, by and large, they've it's worked. The system has worked, and it's created this unbelievable proliferation of technology everywhere, everywhere. I you know I had a friend who told me he was on a safari, and I can't remember. Maybe it was Kenya, and he. He said he was, you know, uh, on this plane. I mean, there's nothing as far uh, higher than like a mud hut, as far as the eye can see. And there's a, a warrior standing there. He's like holding a spear. You know, he's kind of looking out in the horizon. He reaches into his robe and he pulls out an iPhone, right? Like the, the fact is this stuff is everywhere. To say that somehow the system was terribly broken and my God, you know, the, my, we're never, the whole system is going to break apart and there's going to be this terrible uh, inability to get this technology out there. It's just, it's crazy. And by the way, the, the prices for all the stuff have generally been declining on a, uh, if you're looking at the same uh, product over time. The, the last thing I'd note, and again, this gets into the, how the standard setting body works. I mentioned that the incentive, if there is no injunctive relief, right, the incentive for the implementer, the patent user, is to just drag this out as long as possible. There's, there's literally no incentive if there's no threat. On the other hand, it is always the incentive of the patent holder to license, right? It's, it's their incentive because not only because that's how they make money, right? They, they want a license, right? They, they want to proliferate their technology as widely as possible. But also, if you are participating in a standards body, it's not a one-shot deal, right? You're constantly developing and updating and getting new and more standards. If you were a patent implementer and a contributor of technology to standards, and you made it very difficult for uh, entities to license your patents, you would find over time that the other participants in the standard setting body would just not use your technology, no matter how good it is. They would just design around your technology. So there's, there is every incentive on the part of the, the standard essential patent holders to license their technologies and to come to reasonable agreements. Every incentive on the part of implementers to delay and not take licenses if there's no threat that they can be blocked from using the technology. Thanks, and you know that sort of gets to my first question, which would be, hypothetically, I've come up with a, a grand new 6G innovation. And I come to you, Brian and Indiana, and find out that someone's infringing on this. Under the current standard, what would be my solutions for both courts as well as the ITC, and how would that change under this new rule? Brian, I, I mean, I'll, I'll start uh, with the on the ITC side. Um, again, uh, you know, the Section 237, the International Trade Commission administers trade laws. So again, think of this in, in terms of trade competition. And uh, so a U.S. holder of that IP right that's being violated could bring a case currently under Section 337. And the remedy, again, um, under the way the statute was set up, is the remedy for a violation is an exclusion order at the border. So either limited to you who is excluding or a general exclusion order if it's one, you know, like a, a, a type of technology that could, you know, flood in here. So you stop the goods. And then again, doesn't mean those goods could never come in. It incentivizes what? Design around. That's what the patent system, you know, helps to you. You know, you, 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 uh, you publicize your patent and then others look at it and say, well, I can, I can do it better and, and go get a new patent. Well, that's what an exclusion order helps to do, right? It either you incentivize someone to first have to stop using your infringing technology, they can design around, or they can take a license, or you can negotiate. So all of those are, again, I think part of a virtuous cycle that has worked very well. With the direction this policy statement goes, both for the courts, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick to, to the ITC, it's essentially saying the ITC should treat a standard essential patent differently and that the remedy of an exclusion order is one 
that should not be available because the ITC should look at it as if it's something different. And that, again, there's nothing in the statute that would tell a commissioner that they should be treating a standard essential patent uh, differently than a patent. If, you know, are you looking for a violation? There is then the look at you know, the impact on public interest. So again, for any exclusion order, it doesn't matter for any type of uh, ITC case, the commission has the ability to look to see you know, if you excluded that product, would every product be out of the market? You know, in other words, if the patent holder hasn't licensed, couldn't protect it, then there are reasons why a, an ITC order may not go into effect and, they, and they, the, <coughs> excuse me, the commission has the ability to evaluate any negative impacts. And again, that applies whether it's standard essential, regular patent, copyright infringement, antitrust, whatever it is. <laughs> and then further, and this, this is really missed in the policy statement, at the end of the day, the president, in the case of the ITC, has one final look at an exclusion order. And so if, you know, if, if a particular president decides that the policy of administration is they're gonna do, they don't think you should have an exclusion order in this particular case, <coughs> for policy reasons, the, um, the president has a complete authority to disapprove that remedy. So again, there is, not a problem for which this is a solution. There is not a problem that the president should care about. And yet this policy statement acts as if this is what they need to fix. So maybe I'll stop there and turn to Brian and <laughs> get a drink of water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, again, I go, I, I go back to what I said, which is that there's, there's no evidence to me of any problem at all. Right. I, I really don't see any, but your, your question does allow me to talk a little bit about an, another issue, which is related that is also, uh, I think, very harmful to the innovation ecosystem in the United States. And that is the, the same sort of group of, of companies that has been pushing legislatively to dumb down the patent system with, with unfortunately, some success. Uh, they have also used the courts effectively. In fact, there are some who argue that the big legislative campaigns they've run have been in large measure, not just to try to get the legislative changes, many of which they have not gotten, but really to try to influence the courts to look at, oh my gosh, look at all this activity on Capitol Hill, there must be this terrible problem in the patent system, and to put their thumb on the scale against patents. And the truth is that has unfortunately been tremendously successful. And in particular, the single most damaging thing I think that's happened to the patent system in the last two dozen years has been the Supreme Court's decision in eBay versus Merck Exchange in 2006. And what that decision did, and, and there, there are Supreme Court scholars, of which I am I'm not one, uh, uh, who will say that the court got it completely wrong. And it, it took the analysis for a preliminary injunction, where you've got to prove those four steps for equitable relief, and they, they put it onto the construct of a permanent injunction when you're trying to get a patent. It used to be in the United States that getting an injunction uh, if somebody was using your patent without your, your uh, 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 permission or license was almost de rigueur. And the Supreme Court's no, it's equitable relief like anything else, you gotta go through the four part test. And what that has ended up with is actually quite difficult for patent owners to get injunctions. Now, the definition of a patent, the definition of a patent is a, a, a legal construct that gives you the right to exclude others to use it. If you have something, a patent, whose definition is the right to exclude others, but you take away the, the ability to exclude others through getting a court order, keeping them from using it, what is the patent then? Really, it's a, it's a compulsory license because then you get into the situation just like with SEPs. If there's no injunction, all you're talking about is a negotiation over money. And the company that's using your technology, again, has every incentive to lengthen out the litigation, to, to file challenges to that the, the patent is invalid at the US Patent and Trademark Office, to file that multiple times, to drag it out, because it is the, the rare company, honestly, that has the ability uh, to defend its patent with a determined, deep pocketed infringer, especially, again, when you can't get an injunction stopping them from using it. Um, and I also invite folks listening in, you know, please do use the Q&A so that we get your questions uh, in here as well. Uh, my next question would be, we've looked at and talked about the competitors, obviously the competition with China. 
Uh, what are our allies and partners in, in Europe, UK, Japan, other places doing with, with SEPs and SEP policy? And are we missing out on opportunities to, to better coordinate a, a Western approach and work with allies on this issue? Give you the right to go first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, I know less about this, candidly. Uh, I, I do know, I mean, look, these standards bodies are international. Uh, yeah. I do know there have been efforts uh, internationally, like there have been here in the United States, to dumb down standards policies. Uh, there was, in fact, one standards organization that, that did decide you can't get, uh, our rules say that you can't get uh, injunctive relief. And that has really set that standards body off on kind of a just an island a little bit. Uh, most of the other groups, again, which are quite international, uh, because they've got sort of strong governance structures and it's all consensus driven, they, they didn't agree to that because, of course, the patent owners, they wouldn't agree to it because it doesn't make any sense from the standpoint of trying to get to this consensus approach. From my standpoint, having injunctive relief is actually a, uh, a benefit toward trying to get to an agreement. If you, if you don't have that, again, like every incentive is, but, but if you know, both parties know that they've got power in certain respects over one or the other, that really leads to a, a resolution, uh, I, I think. So um, in, in terms of, I don't know uh, Japan, Europe, I will say there's a whole new issue where, where China is issuing what's called anti-suit injunctions, trying to make it so that it's the Chinese courts that get to set the international value of these standard essential patents. Uh, again, you're talking about the Chinese courts setting the value of patents that are largely held by Western companies that Chinese technology companies are the ones buying, right? So it's, it, it would be, a, a, I think, a, a really negative policy uh, if China were able to, to be the, uh, really the forum in which most of these disputes are settled because they're, they're interested parties. And I, I think it's a, a couple of observations on that. I mean, one, I guess it was, when we think about it, we think of, of Germany as usually been a very strong on patents and, and, and somewhat of an outlier even in the, in the European Union in terms of their approach and, and their use of injunctions and kind of uh, efficient court systems for patent owners. But um, I think Brian's exactly right, which is, you know, the, well, the same companies we're talking about, you know, operating in the United States are operating in Europe and China and all these places. So a lot of the things we're talking about um, are initiatives that, that the companies are trying in, in different parts of the world. One thing that um, I don't know the answer to this, but I, but I throw it out because I think it's an interesting question is um, with the changes that we've seen, I mean, I think the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the, um, you know, what the Chinese reaction will be, and I think even maybe the um, uh, a kind of a change in the United States in terms of how China um, has kind of chosen not to be the responsible international actor that we may have thought they were going to be when they joined the WTO. I don't know if that will change some of the um, incentives that we've seen in, in trying to change. Like maybe it, it maybe it will put some some companies um, might revisit how we think about that because it's no longer the same globalized world that we were talking about, like this race to win in standards, I think becomes even more important in the environment we're in than it was even five years ago. So, um, you know, I don't know how that, uh, again, the, the, as, the, as, as Brian points out, the standard setting bodies are consensus setting um, organizations. Um, at some point, the consensus on what that all means may break down. And, and, you know, I think, again, the US should be thinking ahead to that possibility and not the one that we've lived in in the last, you know, I don't know, several, many years. Well, one of the things that also comes up too, we, we've talked about how this is the foundation for the, the future R&D and, and Brian, particularly too, with your hat at the Innovation Alliance, the money that comes from these licenses and, and the R&D, explain to you why that's not replaceable with federal R&D money, that it's not the same process that you can't just throw in, you know, even as we talk about very generous changes in policy for R&D, why it's why it's not the same just to to change that with uh, with throwing federal dollars or incentives at it. Yeah, I mean, my, my view is, I'd say generous ish. You know, even fifty billion dollars 
which is what we're talking about. Well, I guess $52 billion in the CHIPS Act that's working its way through Congress now and the, the competes and, and USICA bills. That's kind of a drop in the bucket when you're talking about the entire American economy. I mean, you've got uh, probably you could get a, a grouping of some of the largest companies and, you know, 10, maybe 10 of those would spend about that much. And there are thousands of other companies trying to do this work. So the, the, the money is vast and enormous. I don't think the federal government could ever contribute uh, the, the kind of funds you really need, nor do I think they could do it in a way that would be as nimble and as effective as you can in the private sector where you, I mean, you, you don't have the same sort of political considerations, right? It's, it's really just about the, the brute force. How do we compete with our competitors? And it's, uh, I mean, look, this is a, in some respects a matter of, of philosophy, but I, I tend to believe pretty strongly in markets and the, the, the kind of spur of, to the motivation and to innovation that that, that provides. I, I, I'm, look, I'm a Democrat, so I, I believe in government. I think government can solve problems. But when you're talking about this kind of a, a, an enterprise, I, I just think the private sector is, is just far more efficient and effective. You, the last thing I'd say is I personally would not want the federal government deciding what are the right problems for the private sector to solve, right? That's something also I think is uh, best left to, uh, to the market. Yeah, and the one thing I'd add on that, Dan, is it's just, again, I think we need to look at our history and look how the United States became this, you know, this center of innovation. And it, and again, not that the government hasn't played a role in, in by being a Republican, I, I think there are rooms for public uh, private partnerships. But just generally, if you look at the ecosystem, the ecosystem that produces an Elon Musk, um, you know, is, is not based on the government telling him what he should have been doing or what you should invest in, right? And yet, you know, he's on the lead of where this government would now want to invest, which is on EV, EV vehicles, right? So I think our ecosystem that was supported by strong IP laws has has shown us the way we should be going. And that's why I did the, 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 the somehow that the answer now is, you know, we need to, we need a totally different system because, you know, this system is broken. I just don't think is supported by looking at those companies who've come out, who've come out of this and who are, have been our ecosystem has been the um, you know admired by the world. I mean the Chinese are copying it and, and they are innovating. I'm not I, I I agree with Brian that I think they've they've moved because they they looked at the United States and said, you know, we need companies like that. How do we you know direct all the forces of the you know the Communist Party at it and try to do it and the, and they'll be able to do that in some cases because in some cases monies and subsidies will will get results, right? We know that. But it's not the same system that produces just, you know, the small entrepreneurs, the people with, you know, with an idea that need to sell it to a company and have a venture capital. I mean, that is a system, I think, to be admired um, and not to be demonized. And, and I think that's, that's where, um, you know, I hope we can make a turn back towards seeing it as a virtue and, and, and not something to be demonized and changed. And, and quick, before I, before I turn it to Glenn, I know we've talked, obviously, a lot about 5G cell phones we've also touched on you know quantum ai what are the other technologies that are, are very key companies that should be focused on this this sep issue and be keeping an eye on these changes to ip policy i mean those are really the areas it's it's shown up a lot in telecommunications so i mean if you sort of think about it in that respect it's also like everything involved with the internet of things so, uh, I mean, it could be your dishwasher that's telling you that, uh, you know, my, your dishes are done or your refrigerator telling you that you're out of eggs. I mean, they're, they're, the, the, of course, autonomous vehicles, another mm -hmm. great example. I mean, truly inventions yet to be conceived are likely to be in this sphere, this kind of cutting edge, because, you know, you're looking at uh, the communication from, from one to another, but also standardized technology that can be used across the whole platform. And whenever you have that, you are likely to run into standard the standards bodies and standard essential patents. Well, I want to thank you all. I think the, you know, the message of, of, of course, as we always say, don't try to out China, China, uh, and also not, not looking for uh, uh, solutions in search of problems. Uh, always need to avoid that as well. So Glenn, uh, I'll turn to you, but thank you all. It's been a great conversation. Well, I, I want to echo 
the thanks um, to, to Deanna and Brian for joining us and sharing their insights with us. Thank you, Dan, for uh, managing the conversation. It, it was really a very good unpacking, I think, of, the, of some of these issues and a great discussion from my perspective of the ramifications. Um, you know, we've been thinking quite a lot lately about the competition between efficiency and geopolitics. Um, the reason this is a national security issue is because these technologies are simply ones where the United States and its friends must win the competition to control these technologies because they are so impactful and so deeply important to our way of life. Um, Brian, you were talking about communications and Internet of Things. Um, one of the reasons 5G is so important is that if you're going to have autonomous vehicles, they've got to operate on a 5G backbone that, op that works in real time. There's tremendous security implications to your cars um, being, being connected to a system that your country doesn't produce the technology anymore for. You, you want to produce that technology. You want, to, you want to sell that technology. We and our allies need to be the ones setting standards for these things that others want to use. Um, and not having American companies give up on these things. You, you could make an argument and say, well, China's got a great, a great approach on price. They can produce things cheaper and you know, it'd be easier if a lot of the world just bought the Chinese 5G technology and, and stopped thinking about it. The problems come with what happens to the data and what happens if you disagree with that country on some key issues. And all of a sudden you find yourself having some problems that you are no longer able to overcome. I think we've thought about that quite a bit recently with Russia and energy supplies, and it seemed like quite an efficient thing for Europe to buy energy from Russia, and it seemed to make a lot of sense. You can put the pipelines there and, and uh, get some pretty cheap supply. The problem is when geopolitics intervenes as it does, you're left without a choice, and that is not a good situation to be in. And I think that's why this conversation is so important. We think about the com competitive and security implications, but these policy questions reflect on those outcomes. And we need to think about future results and, and putting in place sensible policies now that will keep us in a position to compete and, and be dominant with our allies like Japan, like Europe, um, on the um, innovation and the dissemination of these technologies. So. Um, Deanna and Brian, I'm grateful to you for spending the time with us to, to help us think through these important issues today. To our participants um, who tuned in and who may watch this, uh, this re recording, thank you for your interest in the issue and we look forward to uh, continuing to help lead um, these kinds of conversations in the near future and we look forward to, um, to all your, your participations as we, uh, as we move forward. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take, Take care. Off. Thank you.